I like to welcome to True House Stories a very good friend of mine. And when I say a friend of mine, I really mean this. He's a great guy. He's probably opened more clubs than I know. <laughs> He's the opening club guy every time you hear about it in New York. It's like they bring Ralphie D'Agostino in to open the room. Ralphie kind of gives it what they call bapti baptism by fire with Ralphie D. I like to welcome the True House Stories from around the world, right here in New York, from Brooklyn, New York, Ralphie D. <laughs> Ralphie, you're the best, brother. Thanks, brother. I want to ask you, first of all, before we get into the first question, how you doing? You know, tell everybody what's going on in your world. How you <sighs> up with COVID and everything? I ask everybody this. Well, uh, I I usually tell the story, and, and a lot of people, you know, uh, you get the doubters, and then you get the people that are, okay, that's great. Uh, I was probably one of the first people to get covid I don't want to see the first, first people, but at least uh, the, of, the, of the people that I know, uh, it was actually my last live gig that I did. I played in um, in Prague, New Year's Eve from 20, uh, 2019 into 2020. And uh, it was at the beginning of when they were first talking about it. There was no pandemic. It wasn't anything like that. And I remember getting on a plane, um, connecting in London, and... You know, you're ready to sit down. You got your seatbelt on, and like there's the I'm sitting in an aisle seat, and there's a lady with two kids, and they are coughing their brains out. And I've been on enough planes to know that when I see somebody like coughing like that, it's inevitable with the recycle there. But now it's a little bit better because of the technology. So what I do, I would take my jacket and put my jacket like you know, my head this way, so. It doesn't blow this way, but unfortunately, three quarters of the flight, that's all they did was cough. I think they gave, she was with two little kids. They gave them Benadryl or something, knocked them out. And then she stopped coughing after a while. But like anything, you're not thinking. I get off the plane, and every year in January, I get a full blown flu all the time. I take flu shots, but I still get it. But it, the flu just, uh, it's like a regular flu. You get, uh, I get, uh, what do you call um, uh, tightness of the chest, coughing, that kind of stuff. So I felt that way. Now my doctors, uh, you can't go nowhere. The, 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 what do you call it? The closing has just started. So I go through the uh, through Zoom with my doctor, and she says, "Yes, yeah, no problem. Okay, I'm going to give you a Z pack. I'm going to give you Mucinex and Tylenol." And I take it, and I remember like two days into it, three days into it. I couldn't get out of bed. I mean, this is a flu. It's just like the worst kind of flu. My ankles, my arms. Uh, I, I was just like somebody, just like I got run over by a truck. Long story short, um, I kept asking her, is it no COVID? And she says, uh, well, we can't tell. You're not going to an emergency room because people going to an emergency room aren't coming out. So I'm like, okay. So I waited three, four days later, had a little bit of fever, and then I went away. I'm like, okay, fine. I didn't get to go to a COVID center. The first time they had to test it, the, uh, the nose test I went, came up negative. And then I had to wait for the first, first antibody test. And um, I had asked my doc, you know, what should I expect? Is this three, um, three scenarios? One, you never had COVID. Two, you have COVID now. And you can transmit it. Three, best of all, you had it and you passed it already. Your body, uh, your immune system killed it. And that's what I ended up getting. My immune system killed it. And I've had to take, since that time, six COVID tests and five antibody tests for various reasons. I had surgery in my mouth, uh, colonoscopy. Uh, See everybody? See what I just said? The yeah. first guy to open the club. The first guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you when go. Figures. When we he said this to us, I said, "Get yeah. out of here!" Yeah. You know? Everybody yeah. else said, to, "No way." Mm. He calls up. Guess what? Mm. And at the at the end of this, and now as of right now, what is it? Two oh nine Wednesday, April fourteenth. I still have antibodies. Fourteen months later, I'm one of two people in my entire doctor's practice 
that has uh, uh, antibodies. And now after technology and all this stuff, they wanted me to go give plasma. And uh, I was supposed to do that, but I forget what happened. First, they wanted me to go down to Florida to go do something. Listen, you know, if I got to go see, telling me I got to go save somebody's life, that's a different story. But just to go down, it was still experimental at the time. But now, um, uh, I'll my, tell you what it changed. Yeah, well, yeah, that was the whole thing. But now I still, I still have the antibodies, and uh, I haven't gotten a vaccine. Yeah, I, my doctor says there's no reason for me to get a vaccine. Now, listen. There's, there's the conspiracy theorists and there's all these other people talking about getting it and not getting it. For me, I just want the world to heal. We need everybody to go back to the way it was or somewhat. So I'm just a little bit worried now. If I got to go to fly somewhere, I don't have a, 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 a vaccination certificate. Are they going to let me on a plane? I mean, they have to. There's got to be some way. The only thing I'm worried about is hopefully maybe it doesn't happen two or three years from now. I grow another ear. Or I get another nostril in my nose. You never know. No, seriously, you never know. But I'm not going to try to worry about that. I just want to move forward. Everybody's had a hard, a hard, uh, hard time dealing with this, no matter who you are, whether you had anti antibodies or not, good people passing away. It's just, it's crazy. It's been a tough year for a lot of people. Yeah. But thank God, Ralphie, you're still here going strong, brother. Yeah, I well, know. Amazes me sometimes. You're meant, you're meant still to do something amazing. We don't know what that is yet, but we, but I do want yeah. something. Who would ever think it would just be all of this time? You know, my career, to speak, so to speak, that was encapsulated into three separate uh, eras or times, and the first era keeps regenerating itself and comes back. Oh, it's and huge. Never goes away. Yeah, it's like it's like a curse. It's a good curse and a, a bad and good curse at the same time. Yeah. It's like you know, okay, but we'll get into that in a minute. Um, everybody always knows before you even get into the whole Sinaiva thing, we got to ask just like everybody else. The first question I always ask is, you know, how does music find the young Ralphie when you're a kid? Hmm. Okay, um, when I was very very young. First of all, let me explain this, and, and this is really important. I don't know, you know, I always watch the people that you interview. Um, I feel I, I, I just wanted to um, put something else out there that a lot of people don't know. Um, everybody has issues in their families when, you know, you're very young. And unfortunately, I was born into a, a, a family that had a lot of, um, a lot of issues. Uh, my mother and father fought constantly. Uh, when you're a little kid, you're in a crib and your mother and father are fighting amongst each other and they don't realize that, you know, you're, you're messing with your kid's head. I, I don't blame them. I'm not going to blame anybody. What happened, happened. It was a long time ago. But that made me grow up into um, uh, very, very, um, you know, just looking. I, I, I just wanted to feel safe. And I had a safe haven actually where I'm living right now, which I'm actually sitting in the house that I was born, which is very rare for a lot of people, but um, things unfolded in my life, I'll explain later. But anyway, uh, I feel very comfortable where I am because of, um, you know, everybody's gone now. I'm the only person that's left, all my grandparents and mothers and fathers. My bro actually, my brother is still alive. I, I still have, a, you know, my son, but I'm just talking about the beginning. Um, it, it, was, it was kind of a rough going, but I always noticed that I think the first, 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 inclination about music to me was I remember seeing believe it or not the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show and I mean I was like I don't know four and it just it, it wasn't that that I remembered the most it was the aftermath of now you're going to kindergarten and you were going to like a discount store and they would have Beatles buttons and uh, Beatles books and and listening to the music on the radio. And, and I also had a, um, uh, I had a, a very big yard that I used to play. And I was an only child at the beginning and uh, I had a pool in the summer and I would always go back there and have a radio. My mother, my grandmother, my grandfather, you know, they had wine, you know, the old Italians had the what the grape vines and the tomatoes and all of that stuff. And it was always a radio playing. And I always, 
listen to music. It just kind of soothed me. It just did something to me. I felt very um, comfortable listening to it. And, you know, like the first things I heard were like the Beatles and then Motown and all through the 60s, all that AM radio stuff. And um, uh, as I got older, I would go to the store across the street from the school. My mother would take me to school and it was like a, like sort of like a candy store slash bargain store slash warehouse. Uh, um, what do you call it? Harvest store. And in the back they had uh, records, you know, the little slots in the thing with record one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It was a little sheet. And I remember records. I don't know how much they were. And oh, can I have you know, buy this? Cause my mother had a, they called it a Victrola. <laughs> and I, I forget what she bought. She bought me like, I don't know, please, please me or, or, or some kind of Motown stuff. And I started to collect stuff. And I just noticed that everything sounded better and my thoughts were better in my head when there was music involved. And, you know, when you come from a, a home of, of yelling and screaming and, and stuff, you wanted to try to get away from that. I mean, I was loved, but it wasn't the, the love that you would expect. Oh, I love me son, like birthday parties and stuff like that. But, um, it, that's, that was my upbringing uh, up until, uh, well, this actually started at the beginning of my life and I still carry today, but, um, I would say up until about, you know, 10 years old or whatever, I started, um, getting interested in being a musician, being on a stage, being, you know, I didn't know how to play guitar. It was a little too complicated. So I took very easily to the drums. Drums were just like, you know, something wipe out when it came out. Oh my God. And it was funny. My corner had a, a, a ice cream parlor where these older kids used to hang out and you would go in there and they would have records that you, that they would, you know, you would win. They would give you a ticket when you got ice cream. And I never forgot the number, 74777. And I remember going around the corner and I looked and I won. The 45 of Wipeout, it was on Dot Records. And Wipeout was like, if you knew how to play Wipeout in a chair, you, you were like, that was like the greatest thing. So that's what got me into the drums and everything. And um, yeah, that's for the, for the first like 10 years of my life. That's what gravitated me towards that. And then, you know, watching the Ed Sullivan show and then seeing the Rolling Stones and Tommy James and Shondell's uh, the, the Young Rascals. I started figuring out that I was attracted to women at a very, very early age. I think the first crush I had on a girl was in second grade and it was a song or, or fourth grade. And the song was called Carrie Ann by um, the Hollies. And this girl's name was Carrie. I remember it. And just like the music, you know, it's like great. And I, I pictured myself being on a stage, being a drummer and this girl looking at me like this going, Oh, he's so cute. That was my thing because it, kind of says, well, I can, I can only, I can do what I like and I can have a social life with it. And it just, it was like your package. And that's how I was up until, uh, you know, until I started into the next phase. So your question was, how does music find me? That's how it got me about the first 10 years of my life. And you do the hollies and the drums, baby, and playing Wipeout. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Which, of course, you go to school playing drums, and you got to realize, everyone, in those days, there was no DJing yet. It was all about live bands. Yeah. Live yeah. All about bands. So and and I wanted to become, you know, uh, uh, the next thing in my mind was, okay, I got to get a set of drums. And I got them when I was, like, 12. And I started, now the real quick, I used to practice, believe it or not, on pillows. Okay. Pillows with drumsticks and just go through the motions of it. And, uh, and I took the playing the drums and I, and I got it to the point. And then that next phase was, okay, I'm going to try to, you know, get into a rock band and stuff. But um, something came into my life that changed that later on, which, you know, that was the road that I was in. But basically it all leads to music being golden, to the golden road. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Okay, so here's the beautiful thing, guys, about today's show. Lately, we've been able to get everyone who has pictures yeah. to yeah. hold them together. And we have pictures to go along with what he's about ready to tell us, the inside track of how this whole thing happened in Brooklyn. And it's a pretty 
incredible story. For me, being a counter, a part of that, I would have been, I would have died to be a part of it. But I guess when you're in the middle of it, you don't see it like that. And he's explained this to us many times that when he was inside, you don't feel that way because you're in it. But when you're on the outside looking through the glass, like if you're looking to the store and you want that item, it's like, wow, oh my God. But he'll tell you the whole other side of it. So Ralphie, of course, high school comes, you're cool and you're hanging out with the chicks and the whole deal. Actually not, no. So then I just went to an all boys high school. <laughs> and the thing was, I, I had thought that when I was coming out of junior high school, my father, rest in peace, was uh, loved uh, electronics. And he was very much into televisions. And, and uh, back then, televisions were tubes. It was very hardly any transistor work. But um, he was always fixing TVs. And now if you connect radios into it, a radio is electronic fixing radios but it wasn't i thought that's what i wanted but it was the music that i really wanted and when i started going uh, coming out of uh i was in junior high i got into junior high school and i realized I was like you know um i think i want to go for this it was actually radio and television pro uh programming which later on became just electronics but um i uh, i Halfway through, I kind of realized that, you know, it was cool and everything, but it wasn't, it wasn't what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do had to do, had to be around music. So what I thought the radio and television thing was going to do, it, it, it was like a bridge to it. And that's what ended up happening. But um, yeah, it was, it was being the music. And, you know, I'm in uh, junior high school. Everything was about music. Uh, where I was, I can tell you where I was at the time. I can tell you what I was doing at the time. I can tell you how I was feeling. There were certain songs that, again, you know, growing up like growing up like me, uh, being uh, very, very sheltered and very introverted, believe it or not. I'm like the last thing I am now is introverted. But back then I was. I had to gravitate to things that were safe for me. I would never gravitate out. It's like, you know, when you cross in the street and you're a kid, you only cross when, well, I would never cross the street unless I was able to and I was told to. So, of course, in fear of something happening. When you have fears at a very young age, it stays with you all your life. But I'll get to that later. But, um, yeah, so now we're in uh, junior high school. And what was your connection? The, the question again? Where we where we are doing this? The question: We're moving into the high school, junior high. We said yeah. you went to all boys school. Yes, we're working our way to where you start to begin to find this music. Yes. Okay. What had happened was, uh, I always stood in. I stood at my neighborhood was a very rough neighborhood. Um, I was the youngest out of the kids in the neighborhood. And unfortunately for me, the kids in the neighborhood were not, 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 not too nice, put it that way. Um, we all grew up, and it was all Italian and everything like that, but it's just, we were just, it's like, I don't know, explaining to other people, but people that lived in New York and people that lived in Brooklyn would understand that, you know, you get to a point in your life when you're a kid, you're playing, you're playing uh, cowboys and robbers, and do this, and all of a sudden the the thing with girls comes, and and you get a little bit mature, and now you start looking at things that you never looked at before, as far as wow, look, this girl, this girl's nice and this, and and then it starts changing to sex. So the little part of you, the innocent part, leaves, and I just got involved with the wrong people. The competition uh, and the competition begins. Yeah, and I was always at the bottom. I got more beatings than you could even imagine. And that's just for my father. I mean, I was so scared of my father. I would avoid, no matter what I did, and my father had his own business, he would be out, you know, and um, he would come home, I would be like, hey, got to be a certain way. Sit at that table, be a certain way. 
And God forbid, he asked me about something that I couldn't answer that was a answer that he would be okay with. Can I remember my mother and father's marriage was a train wreck every single day. It was about one thing or another. It was quiet. My father would come home. My mother had, uh, my mother was an agoraphobic. She, I don't know, she got it postpartum after I was born and whatever, but um, she couldn't leave the house. You know, I think about it now. It's a real shame. But um, she would only go like to the PTA meeting, go to the corner, go to the church, but get in a car and go somewhere. And never, never. And my father was very frustrated over that. And uh, it caused a lot of problems. And when you're living downstairs, you know, I'm, I live on a t- where I live now, but on the top floor, we lived, my, my parents. The middle floor and bottom floor was my grandmother, who was my mother's, uh, my grandmother, my mother's mother. And she hated my father. So every day there was a battle going on. So my mother and father would scream. I would get scared and run downstairs. And then my grandmother was would, in Italian. So watch that boy, the son of a bitch and all that, you know. And when you're a little kid, it's, 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 it's very, so very hard in the brain. So again, I had the safety was with certain people. And my this is my safety zone. So when you grow up like that and it's, it's constant being scared, I needed an out. And music was the out. So when I was a little bit older, when I was like 12, 13, 14, um, my friends had older brothers. And and the older brothers were the the precursor, the generation before me, the ones that, um, I I think it was the draft generation. Because I missed the draft by three years. So these were the guys that they got drafted. They didn't go. It was like, fuck you. We ain't going nowhere. They were staying in the neighborhood. And then back then, if there were MPs coming or something during the war, they would alert them and they would go hard. Their MPs would go through the neighborhood. They didn't see them and they would leave. So these guys um, all had, back then, it was Cadillacs. Everything was Cadillacs or, or, or poor men, like a Monte Carlo. And they, they had true spokes on them. They were really nice cars. And part of it was the sound systems in the cars. Now, me, I'm into rock at the time, and I'm into, like, Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, uh, you know, stuff like that, radio kind of stuff. And I'm still in in that rock band phase, but I remember on Sundays, my friend Mickey Guarino, rest in peace, his parents owned uh, the funeral parlor, because chief me, and he had, like, five brothers. They were all over. And um, they had a station wagon. It was a 1974 Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser. And it had true spokes on it. The, the, the station wing was used to go pick up dead bodies in the morgue. In the morgue. So sometimes we were going. It was like, there's nothing. I grew up in a funeral parlor with just, oh, just it's totally about sick shit. Anyway, in that car, they had, a, they had big speakers in there. And I always remember it was an eight track play in there with these red tapes in there, heavy. And. Oh, okay. Heavy. And there were red tapes, red eight track. There you go. That. That right there, I don't know if the, anybody, probably Rick, who actually was the person who made these tapes, mm-hmm. uh, still has that has these. But they were at the time. What, what numbers are on here? I think it's like fourteen or something. This is like one, two, and three. You're talking volume huh? seventeen, I think. Vi- volume fourteen or seventeen? I can't really tell, but sixteen. No, volume sixteen and seventeen. Yeah, and if you if you look at the music on there, you can tell. Okay. When you're young and in love, yeah, you're looking at the end of 74, beginning of 75. That's when these tapes were out. Now, you have to understand, I was oblivious to this music. I had no, I didn't have no idea what it was, but I do remember first hearing like Satin Soul, Barry White, and, and My Love Supreme, and all these things. But there were certain songs that stood out, like Everlasting Love. Everlasting Love, that was on the radio. Uh, um, Bad Luck was on the radio. Barry White, uh, first man, last man, everything. That was on the radio. But it wasn't like it was, it was the radio played those consistently. It was part of pop radio. It was, remember, it was, it was AM going into FM, I think, at the time. Yeah, it was like, like that kind of stuff. So um, I started getting into this. And now um, I was in the car. We, uh, they used to get these tapes at um, hair cutting places. And it was a place called the Head Shed in Sheep Said Bay. And um, I was with my older brother and his, uh, my, my friend and his older brother. And he said, like, wait in the car. I'm going to go get a haircut. 
And uh, he came out and he had that that thing. And I was I'm looking at it and all the songs and everything. So I was like, wow, this, this, this shit is good. I really, really like this cuff. Yeah, look at that. So so he goes in the in the in the in the shop and he used to sell the eight tracks. What? Okay, the custom mixes. So you pick out how much do you know how much they were back I then? Seven dollars, five dollars or something. But you get like twenty one to twenty five songs. Yeah. Non-stop played mixed eight track. Right. And what was great about it was <clears throat> it was the first tapes, like one, two, three, four, and like that, they weren't they weren't done with they weren't they weren't mixed, beat mixed, because I found out later, they nobody had headphones. Nobody came up with the thing, well, you know what, let's use this and 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 mix the next beat. So they would just like make something and and have something saying, and guys like Joe Donato and, and Gary Baxter and all those guys that came before me ended up perfecting as the years went by. So, but I do remember a turning point was I think it was tape number eight was the first tape that I heard that actually had beat mixing in it, and when I first heard that, that blew me out of the water. Blew, I, I mean, I was like, what? How did we do that? And now I'm realizing, okay, uh, you got to have two turntables. Oh. And you have to be able to play both of them. And I remember going to like a. a, a, a Ralphie, did somebody, did you ask somebody anything or you just, this came in your mind? Uh, what it had was, I, I think it, I, I went to, it, it, when we were kids, there was block parties all over Brooklyn. Block parties were, were big. I, you know, that was that type of like, before there was discos, there were block parties. So, uh, in the neighborhood, it, one summer there could be ten block parties. And when you went to a block party, you got not dressed up, but you wore a nice shirt. You knew there were going to be girls there, and and either there was a band, and sometimes there was a DJ. And I'm like, this yes. guy Vinny, I'm a DJ. And what he did was he had a stereo amplifier and another stereo amplifier, two speakers, two speakers, and he would play one record from one turntable plugged into one and then play another from there. So that was my first, like, oh, okay, I kind of get it. And then uh, I said, wait, I got to do this myself. I got I got so interested in this. I got to do this myself. And I started working for my father. Um, uh, what what kind of work did your father do? I was going to ask you that. Okay, at, at the time when I started to work, my father had a dry cleaning business in Bensonhurst. And, um, I would help him on the weekends and stuff. I would you know, deliver clothes and, and stuff like that. And then when my father would bring the clothes home to the neighborhood, people in the neighborhood, I would, you know, tips like that. I mean, I wasn't making a, th- a big, big money, but it was something that I kept, you know, kept money in my pocket. And then um, when I was in high school, my father retired because my father got sick. He, he got sick very, very early. He didn't take care of himself. He, my father was like a doctor's. I going to doctors and then ended up uh, not being smart, but um, then well, that generation didn't believe in that. No, no, absolutely not. Yeah, my grandfather, same problem. They didn't want to go. No, why doctor? Get out of here! They would say, "Get <laughs> out of here!" Telling me, I ain't taking this. No way. Fun with the doctor, just so they would say. Those that remember, knows what I'm talking about. That yep. generation did not think about vitamins. They actually, let me, in fact, let me light a cigarette right now. <laughs> and mind your goddamn business, they would tell you. I got more pictures of me when I was like an infant with my grandfather with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth with an ass like this. And you know, all cool Italian, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And smoking. <laughs> it's like, welcome well, to the house is a cloud of smoke. Oh yeah, man! Right. Okay, so you so you're the dry cleaner's son. Yes, yeah, dry cleaner's son. Mm-hmm. And my and my the name of my father's business was Maddie D because my last name is D'Agostino, and I mean to me it's a very easy name to pronounce. But okay. for teachers and some people, they would just botch it to the freaking point. I'm like, are you freaking serious? D and oh God, I'll tell you about that. Lad. That also yeah, influenced. I'm calling myself Ralphie D. That was a reason for it. 